Chapter One, Part Two of the Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter One In the Valley, Part Two it was now about noon and the sun became warm despite the december day the turf softened under the rays and the union cavalry left an immense wide trail through the forest it was impossible to miss it and harry careful not to ride into an ambush of rear-guard pickets dropped back a little and also kept slightly to the left of the great trail he could not see the soldiers now but occasionally he heard the deep sound of so many hoofs sinking into the soft turf. Beyond that turfy sigh, no sound from the marching men came to him. The Union troop halted about two o'clock in the afternoon, and the men ate cold food from the knapsacks. They also rested a full hour, and Harry, watching from a distance, felt sure that their lack of hurry indicated a night attack of some kind. They had altered their course slightly, twice, and when they started anew, they did so a third time. Now their purpose occurred suddenly to Harry. It came in a flash of intuition, and he did not again doubt it for a moment. The head of the column was pointed straight toward a tiny village in which food and ammunition for Stonewall Jackson were stored. The place did not have more than a dozen houses, but one of them was a huge tobacco barn stuffed with powder lead medicines which were already worth their weight in gold in the confederacy and other invaluable supplies it had been planned to begin their removal on the morrow to the southern camp at winchester but it would be too late unless he intervened if he did not intervene he a boy riding alone through the forest to defeat the energies of so many men equipped splendidly the confederacy was almost wholly agricultural and was able to produce few such supplies of its own nor could it obtain them in great quantities from europe as the northern navy was drawing its belt of steel about the southern coasts that huge tobacco barn contained a treasure beyond price and harry was resolved to save it he did not yet know how he would save it but he felt that he would all the courage of those border ancestors who won every new day of life as the prize of skill and courage sprang up in him it was no vain heritage happy chance must aid those who trusted and taking a deep curve to the left he galloped through the woods his horse comparatively fresh after easy riding went many miles without showing any signs of weariness the boy knew the country well and it was the object of his circuit to take him ahead of the union troop and to the village which held a small guard of perhaps two hundred men if the happy chance in which he trusted should fail him after all these men could carry off a part of the supplies and the rest could be destroyed to keep them from falling into northern hands he gave his horse a little breathing space and then galloped harder than ever reckoning that he would reach the village in another hour he turned from the woods into one of the narrow roads between farms just wide enough for wagons and increased his speed the afternoon sun was declining filling the west with dusky gold and harry still rode at a great pace along the rough road wondering all the while what would be the nature of the lucky chance in which he was trusting so firmly lower sank the sun and the broad band of dusky gold was narrowing before the advance of the twilight the village was not now more than two miles away and the road dipped down before him sounds like that made by the force behind him the rattle of arms the creak of leather and the beat of hoofs came suddenly to his ears harry halted abruptly 
and reined his horse into some bushes beside the road. Then he heard the sounds more plainly. They were made by cavalry, riding slowly. The great pulses in his throat leaped in quick alarm. Was it possible that they had sent a portion of their force swiftly by another route, and that it was now between him and the village? He listened again, and with every faculty strained. The cavalrymen were riding toward him, and they could not be a part of the Union force. Then they must be of his own South. Surely this was the happy chance of which he had dreamed. Again the great pulses leaped, but with a different emotion. Scorning every risk, he reined his horse back into the road and rode straight forward. The heads of men were just topping the rise, and a few moments later they and the horses they bestrode came into full view. It was a thankful thrill that shot through him now. The sun, almost sunk, sent a last golden shower across them and disclosed the dingy gray of their uniforms and the lean, tanned faces. Uttering a shout of joy and holding up a hand to show that he was a friend, Harry galloped forward. A young man at the head of the troop, a captain by his uniform, and evidently the leader, gave the signal to his men to stop and received the boy who came alone. Who are you? he asked. I'm Harry Kenton, a lieutenant in the army of Stonewall Jackson and an aide on the staff of Colonel Leonidas Talbot, colonel of the regiment known as the Invincibles. I've heard of that regiment, South Carolinians at first, but now mostly Virginians. The Virginians filled up the gaps that were made on the battlefield. Harry spoke proudly, and the young captain smiled. The boy regarded him with increasing interest. Somehow he was reminded of Jeb Stuart, although this man was younger, not having passed his boyhood long. It was evident that he was tall. Thick yellow curls showed from under the edge of his cap. His face, like Harry's, had turned red before wind and rain. His dress was a marvel, made of the finest gray without a spot or stain. A sash of light blue silk encircled his waist, and the costly gray cloak thrown back a little from his shoulders revealed a silk lining of the same delicate blue tint. His gauntlets were made of the finest buckskin, and a gold-hilted small sword swung from his sash. A dandy, thought Harry, but the bravest of the brave for all that. My name's Sherburne, Captain Philip Sherburne, said the young leader. I'm from the Valley of Virginia, and so are my men. We belong to Stonewall Jackson's army, too, but we've been away most of the time on scouting duty. That's the reason you don't know us. We're going toward Winchester after another of our fruitless rides. But it won't be fruitless this time, exclaimed Harry eagerly. A Union force of nearly a thousand men is on its way to destroy the stores at the village, the stores that were to be moved to a safer place tomorrow. How do you know? I've seen them. I was behind them at first and followed them for a long time before I guessed their purpose. Then I curved about them, galloped through the woods, and rode on here, hoping for the lucky chance that has come with you. Harry, as he spoke, saw the eyes of the young captain leap and flame, and he knew he was in the presence of one of those knightly souls thrown up so often in the war, most often by the border states. They were youths who rode forth to battle in the spirit of high romance. You ask us to go back to the village and help defend the stores, said Philip Sherburne. That's just what I do ask and expect. Of course, we'd have done it without the asking, and glad of it. What a chance for us, as well as for you. He turned and faced his men. The golden glow of the sun was gone now, but a silver tint from the twilight touched his face. Harry saw there the blaze of the knightly spirit that craved adventure. Men, he said in clear, happy tones, we've ridden for days and days in quests that brought nothing. Now the enemy is at hand, nearly a thousand strong, 
and means to destroy our stores. There are two hundred of you, and there are two hundred more guarding the stores. If there's a single one among you who says he must ride on to Winchester, let him hold up his hand. Not a hand was raised, and the bold young captain laughed. I don't need to put the other side of the question, he said to Harry. They're as eager as I am to scorch the faces of the Yankees. The order was given to turn and ride. The men, not one of whom was over twenty-five, obeyed it eagerly and galloped for the village, every heart throbbing with the desire for action. They were all from the rich farms in the valleys, splendid horsemen, fine marksmen, and alive with youth and courage no deed was too great for them. Harry was proud to ride with them, and he told more of the story to Sherburne as they covered the short distance to the village. Old Jack would order us to do just what we're doing, said Sherburne. He wants his officers to obey orders, but he wants them to think, too. Harry saw his eyes flash again, and something in his own mind answered to the spirit of adventure which burned so brightly in this young man. He looked over the troop, and as far as he could see, the faces of all were flushed with the same hope. He knew with sudden certainty that the Union forces would never take that warehouse and its precious contents. These were the very flower of that cavalry of the South destined to become so famous. You know the village? said Sherburne to Harry. Yes, I passed there last night. What defense has it? About two hundred men. They are strangers to the region, drawn from the Tidewater country, and I don't think they're as good as most of General Jackson's men. Lack of discipline, you think? Yes, but the material is fine. All right, then we'll see that they acquire discipline. Nothing like the enemy's fire to teach men what war is. They were riding at good speed toward the village while they talked, and Harry had become at once the friend and lieutenant of young Captain Sherburne. His manner was so pleasant, so intimate, so full of charm, that he did not have the power or the will to resist it. They soon saw Hertford, a village so little that it was not able to put itself on the map. It stood on the crest of a low hill, and the tobacco barn was about as large as all the other buildings combined. The twilight had now merged into night, but there was a bright sky and plenty of stars, and they saw well. Captain Sherburne stopped his troop at a distance of three or four hundred yards while they were still under cover of the forest. "'What's the name of the commander there?' he asked. "'McGee,' Harry replied. "'Means well.' but rather obstinate. That's the way with most of these untrained men. We mustn't risk being shot up by those whom we've come to help. Lasley, give them a call from the bugle. Make it low and soft, though. We don't want those behind us to hear it. Lasley, a boy no older than Harry, rode forward a dozen yards in front of the troop, put his bugle to his lips, and blew a soft warning call. Harry had been stirred by the first sound of a hostile trumpet hours before, and now this, the note of a friend, thrilled him again. He gazed intently at the village, knowing that the pickets would be on watch, and presently he saw men appear at the edge of the hill just in front of the great warehouse. They were the pickets, beyond a doubt, because the silver starshine glinted along the blades of their bayonets. The bugler gave one more call. It was a soft and pleasing sound. It said very plainly that the one who blew and those with him were friends. Two men in uniform joined the pickets beside the warehouse and looked toward the point whence the note of the bugle came. Forward, said Captain Philip Sherburne, himself leading the way, Harry by his side. The troops, wheeling back into the road and marching by fours in perfect order, rode straight toward the village. Who comes? was the stern hail. A troop of Stonewall Jackson's cavalry to help you, replied Sherburne. You are about to be attacked by a northern division eight hundred strong. Who says so? came the question, in a tone tinged with unbelief, 
and Harry knew it was the stubborn and dogmatic McGee who spoke. Lieutenant Harry Kenton of the Invincibles, one of Stonewall Jackson's best regiments, has seen them. You know him. He was here yesterday. As he spoke, Captain Sherburne sprang from his horse and pointed to Harry. You remember me, Captain McGee, said Harry. I stopped with you a minute yesterday. I rode on a scouting expedition, and I have seen the Union force myself. It outnumbers us at least two to one, but we'll have the advantage of the defense. Yes, I know you, said McGee, his heavy and strong, but not very intelligent face brightening a little. But it's a great responsibility I've got here. We ought to have had more troops to defend such valuable stores. I've got two hundred men, Captain, and I should say that you've about the same. It was then that Captain Philip Sherburne showed his knightly character, speaking words that made Harry's admiration of him immense. I haven't any men, Captain McGee, he said, but you have four hundred, and I'll help my commander as much as I can. McGee's eyes gleamed. Harry saw that while not of alert mind, he was nevertheless a gentleman. We work together, Captain Sherburne, he said gratefully, and I thank God you've come. What splendid men you have. Captain Sherburne's eyes gleamed also. This troop of his was his pride, and he sought always to keep it bright and sharp like a polished sword blade. Whatever you wish, Captain McGee, but it will take us all to repel the enemy. Kenton here, who saw them well, says they have a fine, disciplined force. The men now dismounted and led their horses to a little grove just in the rear of the warehouse, where they were tethered under the guard of the villagers, all red-hot partisans of the South. Then the four hundred men, armed with rifles and carbines, disposed themselves about the warehouse, the bulk of them watching the road along which the attacking force was almost sure to come. Harry took his place with Sherburne, and once more he was compelled to admire the young captain's tact and charm of manner. He directed everything by example and suggestion, but all the while he made the heavy Captain McGee think that he himself was doing it. Sherburne and Harry walked down the road a little distance. "'Aren't you glad to be here, Kenton?' asked the captain in a somewhat whimsical tone. "'I'm glad to help, of course. "'Yes, but there's more. "'When I came to war, I came to fight. "'And if we save the stores, look how we'll stand in old Jack's mind. "'Lord, Kenton, but he's a queer man. "'You'd never take any notice of him if you didn't know who he was.' but I'd rather have one flash of approval from those solemn eyes of his than whole dictionaries of praise from all the other generals I know. I saw him at Bull Run when he saved the day. So did I. The regiment that I was with didn't come up until near the close, but our baptism of battle was pretty thorough all the same. Hark! Did you think you heard anything, Kenton? Harry listened attentively. Yes, I hear something, he replied. It's very soft, but I should say that it's the distant beat of hoofs. And of many hoofs. So I think. Then it's our friends of the North coming to take what we want to keep. A few minutes more, Kenton, and they'll be here. They slipped back toward the warehouse, and Harry's heart began to throb heavily. He knew that Sherburne's words would soon come true. End of chapter 1, part 2 Recording by Lucretia B.